Well, as we uh, go to the word this morning, let's bow together in a word of prayer. Our Father, we ask this morning that you would please guide us by your spirit as we approach your word. We want to hear your voice come through loud and clear. And yet our sin and our, uh, our tiredness or our uh, other uh, dulled faculties keep us from truly engaging and, uh, and truly learning from your word. And so I pray, Father, that you would please help us this morning to learn with open hearts that we might worship you as you deserve. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, when I was back in college, which wasn't that long ago, but it was still uh, over a decade, and there was a video that surfaced online in the, uh, the fresh new thing called YouTube at the time, uh, and it looked somewhat like a, a, a cable infomercial, you know, with the bright yellow letters on there and the phone number you can call and, and clips that kind of uh, go through and trying to convince you to buy something, and it was jokingly uh, trying to sell a, a, collect, a CD collection called Me Worship. And it was 20 of your favorite songs all about you that you can uh, celebrate and you can sing about your own greatness and uh, you can share with your friends if you have any. Um, it had song titles such as Now I Lift My Name on High, uh, It's All About Me, I Exalt Me, and there's none like me. Now, taken seriously, those are blasphemous words, but what it was trying to do was to humorously draw attention to the reality that modern worship songs can often tend to be more man-centered than God-centered. They can tend to focus more on us than they do focus on God. And while lyrics in songs are never so crudely self-worshipping as that video was, was, uh, was pointing out, it is still possible for the focus of the church's worship to shift. And it can come in, form of, in the form of songs which th- the church sings uh, more about us than about God, more about what, we've, what we have than what God has given and maybe more about our privileged status than God's exalted throne. And you see, worship, rightly understood, is a response by his cre- God's creatures, a response of praise and adoration to both the character and the work of God. As God is and God works in His world, so then His creatures respond in praise and adoration to all that they see who He is. And this response of praise and adoration begins in our hearts and then is expressed in prayer or song back to God. And so therefore, the starting place for worship is not to look at ourselves but to look upon God, to see His beauty and His majesty, to see the one who is wholly unlike us, and to marvel at His greatness. And so we too need to make sure that we are worshiping rightly, that we are starting in the right place, and that our praise and adoration stems from our adoration of who God is, which means that we must behold Him. And our passage this morning is going to help us to do that, help us to see God for who He is and help us to adore Him and worship Him rightly. If you're not there already, I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 1 in your personal copy of God's Word. If you don't have your own Bible with you today, there's a Bible in the pew rack directly in front of you. I invite you to Pull out and turn to page 1017, where you'll find our passage this morning. Luke chapter 1, and we are looking this morning at verses 46 through 56. 46 through 56. Let's read the passage together, and then we'll begin to look at it 
together. Luke chapter 1, verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. Now, verse 46, as we began reading in this morning, begins a section of Mary's praise to the Lord. But let's remember the context as we we enter into this declaration of praise. This statement that Mary gives here, this song, is a response to what Elizabeth had said to her in the verses previous. And if you remember, we looked at last week that these two special ladies were meeting here for the first time since becoming pregnant. That they uh, were able to hear, be able to greet one another as Elizabeth has John in her womb and Mary has Jesus the Messiah in her womb. And so these verses uh, previous in verse 39 through 45, we saw this greeting and this, this coming together of these two special ladies. And it's upon their meeting that John, who's in the womb of Elizabeth, a six-month-old fetus at the time, leaped in the womb of his mother, indicating that Mary was carrying the Son of God, the Messiah. And this prophetic movement in the womb of Elizabeth that was empowered by the Holy Spirit, prompted Elizabeth to break out into loud, joyful praise and to celebrate Mary's special status and faithful obedience. Now, all of this was meant to confirm to us, the readers, and to Mary and Elizabeth at the time, that Jesus was someone special. Jesus was unlike any other person, unlike any other baby, that even another baby in The womb was leaping for joy at his presence. Now because of this joy and commendation from Elizabeth, Mary is then drawn to respond with words of her own. She then gives a magnificent declaration of praise to God. Now this hymn that we have recorded here in verses 46 through 55 has been known throughout Christian tradition as the Magnificat. The Magnificat, it gets its name from the first word in the Latin translation of this song that we see in our translation as magnifies or glorifies or exalts. And in the Greek as well as in the Latin, the the first phrase is, the first word in the phrase is the verb uh, magnificat in Latin. But let's, as we, as we dive into this hymn here this morning, let's remember that these, these words are spoken by a young teenage woman. She being a faithful Jew at only, scholars estimate, anywhere between 12 and 14 years of age, what had been well steeped in the Scriptures, which for her was the Old Testament. And this resulted in a hymn of praise that pulls together so many Old Testament allusions and, 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 and even some direct quotations. And it gives a, an, an aspiring portrait of, for all teenagers today to aspire to know the Word of God in such a way that the praise of God that leaps from their mouths would be so filled with the words of Scripture. 
I wish I was that rooted in the Word of God when I was a teenager. Now, the clearest connections in her hymn to the Old Testament is a hymn that's on the lips of Hannah recorded for us in 1 Samuel chapter 2. And it makes us wonder whether Mary would have been meditating upon this text, meditating upon the, the, the reality of what was going on in the life of Hannah in the Old Testament as she took, Mary took her three to four day journey down from, from Nazareth down to the Judean hill country thinking upon what God was doing in her and how God was providing a child for her and how God provided a child for Hannah oh so many years before. But however it came about, many of the themes that are found in Hannah's hymn are expressed in Mary's as well. Now I want you to see the general structure of and flow of Mary's hymn. So let's look at the text just briefly uh, here in, in a broad sense. You'll notice in verses 46 through 50, Mary is worshiping God for God's action to her personally. There's the words, my soul, my spirit. Uh, He's referencing me and and what he's, things he's done for me. There's There's a highlighting of her own personal experience and praising God for what God has done to her and in her life personally. But then in verses 51 through 55, she changes and begins to worship God for his action generally to humanity and then specifically to the nation of Israel, his chosen people. And so we will begin looking at the first section today and then we'll look at the the second section, verses 51 through 55, in two weeks. In next week, in honor of Reformation Sunday, I will be preaching a message on the doctrines of of the Reformation, and then we will return to this text after that. So we'll return to it in two weeks. So in the first section here of Mary's hymn, she is praising God and looks to God's dealing with her personally as a prompt for her worship. As she meditates on God's kind actions towards her, she is led to burst out in praise to the Lord. And there's much that we can learn from Mary's hymn, as we seek to worship God truly. So therefore, as we examine Mary's praise to God, we will see six characteristics of God, six characteristics of God displayed in his dealing with us individually that we would meditate on so that we would be prompted to authentic and true worship. We're going to see how Mary directs her mind to meditate upon the character of God, and we're then going to see how we should meditate upon those same characteristics so that our worship will be true and authentic before the Lord. And so the first characteristic that we see in this passage that we are to uh, praise God for is, number one, His greatness. And we see this in verse 46, His greatness. Now, her hymn here begins with two parallel lines of poetry expressing her praise. It, it's, it, she breaks forth here after Elizabeth has spoken like, like a dam breaking forth after holding too much water. She simply can't contain it. She's got to express what she is feeling inside. And so she breaks out into this praise overflowing from a heart of adoration. And we see that these two parallel lines that's in our text is verses 46 and 47 are very parallel. We see that my soul and my spirit are parallel and magnifies and rejoices and the Lord and God my Savior. She's duplicating her praise but highlighting different realities in the midst of that duplication. She says my soul and my spirit is is the subject of the verbs here. And this is uh, Mary's way of speaking about her inner self. It's a Hebraic and, and poetic way to say, I, I magnify the Lord. I rejoice in God. But it also speaks to the depth of her praise. It's not just her lips speaking. It's my soul, my spirit, the depths within me that this praise is bursting forth. So from deep in her being, she magnifies the Lord. 
Now, the Lord here is the designation for Yahweh in the Old Testament, the covenant God of Israel. He is the one true God, and Mary is directing her praise precisely at that one true God as revealed throughout the Bible. And she begins praising him by magnifying him. Now, what does it mean to magnify something, especially magnifying the Lord? It's not a word that we use all that much, and, and frankly, it's actually not even in our, our, it hasn't found its way into our worship songs that we're, we sing all that much these days. So what does it mean to magnify? Well, I'd like to borrow an illustration that I first heard from John Piper, pastor and author, and he talks about two ways that we can magnify something as illustrated by a microscope and a telescope. I thought this was helpful, and hopefully it is for you as well. Now, if you think about it, a microscope magnifies something, but it magnifies it by, by making something small look bigger than it really is. In contrast, a telescope, like that's looking out into the stars and the planets out in space, is magnifying as well. But what it's doing is trying to make something that looks small but is actually huge look closer to reality of what it really is. It's helping us who are so far away to actually grasp the size of, of those planets and those stars and those galaxies. And so, one, the, the microscope is moving away from reality. It's, it's making these tiny microscopic things look bigger than they really are. And the other is moving closer to reality, trying to get something that, that might look small to us, but trying to get it to get us to perceive the actual greatness of those objects. Now, as you know, both tools are valuable in the study of the natural world, but, but we need to be clear that to magnify the Lord like a microscope, is actually blasphemous. To say that we're magnifying God because he's actually really tiny and we're trying to just make him look bigger and, and trying to make him sound bigger than he really is doesn't give any honor or glory to God at all. In fact, it belittles him. But when we say we magnify the Lord like a telescope, what we're saying is that he is so great and we are trying to make him seem greater and be perceived as great as he really is. We want to get closer to reality. And so we want to speak of his greatness. We want to study his greatness. We want to meditate upon his greatness so that we and others might know how great he truly is. This is what the Bible calls us to do when we're called to glorify and exalt and magnify the Lord. It's holding God in the highest esteem possible and seeking to heap praise and adoration upon him for being so great because he is the greatest being in the entire universe no one is greater than he and so in this even in this first declaration we see mary's submissive heart do we not she is the servant or slave of the lord as she had said earlier in the text she recognizes that he as the great one is sovereign over her. And she confesses his lordship and she prompts her to, to magnify and want to highlight that greatness of God and do all that she can. And she's essentially saying, God, I want you to be seen and treasured as the great one that you are and I want to do all that I can to praise you for your greatness. And friends, this is what we too must do. We need to meditate upon the greatness of God, the reality of who He is and how He has revealed Himself in His Word so that we might then declare and might seek to magnify the Lord in our own hearts and in our own speech and in our own decisions and lives. Because how we live shows that we're magnifying something, that we're declaring something to be great. And this world is, bombards us with messages about what you think should be great and what you should spend your time on and what you should spend your money on and how you should spend your days. But we must be clear in our own hearts and in our lives that no one and nothing is greater than the Lord our God. The rulers and politicians of this world are not greater 
than the Lord. Our economic prosperity is not greater than God. Our entertainment and pleasure is not greater than the Lord. Our own autonomy and rights are not greater than the Lord. Because you see, no one else holds the universe in the palm of his hands. No one else created the universe with the words of his mouth. No one else upholds everything by the word of his power. No one else has the authority or power to change people and world events. And no one else is exalted above the heavens. That's that's a unique status that he alone holds. Our triune God is the greatest and deserving of our worship. And so we must train our minds to think on the greatness of God over all the things around us and train our hearts to glory and rejoice and celebrate just like Mary did, that we might be able to say, my soul magnifies the Lord. May God make that true in our everyday lives, that we magnify Him in all that we do. So the first characteristic that we see here in Mary's song that should prompt us to praise is first his greatness. The second characteristic that we see in verse 47 is his salvation. His salvation. Mary goes on saying, And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. This line, as we said, is parallel with the first, but but brings in some new dynamics. The first is we see Mary's joy. The first is all about magnifying God and and, and showing off how great and glorious He is. But the second one describes Mary's own delight in that God. She's overjoyed. This word means to be exceedingly joyful. She's bubbling out with joy at this God. She did not glorify God in a cold, heartless way. Her praise of God brought the deepest joy. And notice these parallels of magnifying the Lord and rejoicing in God. And again, we see that the believer's joy is not at odds with God's glory. For when we seek the glory of God, magnify Him, and it's then that we receive the greatest joy. We glorify Him, we receive the greatest joy. We can pursue both ends, God's glory and our true happiness, and see both fulfilled. This is, as John Piper has has stated throughout his ministry, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. God is not glorified if we just declare His glory. He's glorified when we are satisfied in his glory and we treasure it as the greatest thing in the world and it brings us the greatest joy and that's what mary models for us here but what specifically causes her joy she says it's god my savior now this theme of god's salvation of joy in god's salvation is found throughout the old testament and we don't have time to turn to these passages, but you can write these down. Psalm 35, verse 9. My soul will rejoice in the Lord, exulting in His salvation. Or Isaiah 61, 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. Why? For He has clothed me with the garments of salvation, and He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. You see, Mary's joy in God of, in the God of her salvation was in line with the godly through the ages. For godly people first recognize their need for salvation, and then they look to God to save them. And so what we see here, by Mary saying, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, she recognizes that she needs a Savior, which means that she sees her sinfulness. She sees the fact that she needs to be redeemed just like anybody else. But not only that, Mary here recognizes that only through the Lord that she's going to be saved and that it's ultimately going to be through the Son in her womb. Because what did the angel declare that what the name of her son was going to be? Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. 
Mary is grappling with this wonderful reality that she is going to be saved from her sins by the child in her womb. Now, she doesn't have, she doesn't know the rest of the story at this point, but she knows that somehow God is going to bring about her salvation through this Messiah. And folks, this likewise is where our joy is found, is in the Son of Mary, Jesus Christ, who is our Savior. Now, how is He our Savior? How is He the Savior of the world? How is it that through Jesus, people are saved? Well, it's because He alone lived a perfect life and was obedient to the point of death, death on a cross, as Philippians 2 says. And it's only through his work upon the cross that he saved us from the punishment that the justice of God required of our sin. Because of our sin, God's justice required that each one of us be punished for that sin. And yet, by Jesus taking our place and receiving, bearing the wrath of God on our behalf as the perfect sacrifice, he is able to be the Savior of his people. And so, He is the only Savior that you can rejoice in because He's the only Savior that can save you from your sin. And that's all your sin. It's not a part of your sin. It's not half of your sin. He saves you completely. His sacrifice is sufficient for you to be accepted before a holy God. And Christian, this is the gospel, is it not? That Jesus has saved you from your sin. This is the good news for your soul. So that your spirit too can rejoice in God your Savior. Because you are saved from your sin. Now if we find ourselves lacking joy, not quite expressing it, not bubbling up with joy like Mary is, then I suggest that we maybe need to go back and refocus on the gospel. That we need to get an accurate view of all that Jesus has done for us so that our joy too could spring from the fact that God is our Savior. You need to see that, that your greatest problem has been solved. That your eternal destiny has been secured. And remember that God doesn't save you because you're someone great. You were deserving wrath because of your sin. But it's simply because of His grace that you are saved which leads us to the third characteristic that we see in this passage and that is his grace we've seen his greatness his salvation and thirdly we see God's grace in verse 48 look at it with me verse 48 for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant for behold from now on all generations will call me blessed The verse here begins with the word for. This indicates to us that Mary is giving an official reason for why her soul could magnify and her spirit could rejoice. I can can rejoice in these ways for or because he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. Mary praises God because of the gracious look of God upon her. Now, Mary recognizes that she is a practical nobody in the society of her day. Again, a young teenage woman in the backcountry town of Nazareth. I mean, there is no way in which uh, she has any sort of fame. She has any sort of clout. She is simply a humble gal from Galilee. And so, therefore, she acknowledges her humble estate, her lowly estate. She knew that that there was nothing from a physical standpoint that would have drawn the eye of God. And yet, God has looked upon her, he says, she says. He has looked upon the humble estate of his servant. And in this, Mary, this causes Mary's rejoicing. She realizes that God 
has looked upon her with love and with care and with grace. Because you see, when God looks upon his servants, as, as he, she's describing here, it's not a dispassionate look. It's not like, oh yeah, I notice you. No, it's a, it's a focus. It's a love. It's a cherish. He's looking with an intent to bless. He's looking with an intent to shower grace. In the midst of his sovereign agenda, Mary is recognizing you are you're magnifying you, God, because you are the greatest. And yet in the midst of all of your greatness and all that you're doing, you have chosen to, to stop and take notice of me. And she is wowed and humbled, and it prompts her to praise. This reality is captured in Psalm 138, verse 6, that says, For though the Lord is high, He regards the lowly. For though the Lord is high, He regards the lowly. Now Mary's humility is evident throughout the narrative in Luke. But especially here, as she calls her position a humble estate and then titles herself the Lord's servant, could be translated the Lord's slave, doulas, meaning in complete subservient position to her master. And so here again, she confesses her complete allegiance to the Lord. But then because of God's grace to her, because God looks down upon her with such grace, she delights in the fact that all generations will call her blessed. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. She realizes that because of the grace of God upon her, generations of believers will hold her in a special place. Now, it's important to state, as we've been saying through this narrative, that there's this gives no legitimacy to the Roman Catholic position of the veneration of Mary. Yes, we can call her blessed, but that doesn't mean that we pray to her or worship her in any sort of way. Because what we are, are noticing when we call her blessed is that God's favor is upon her. In other words, we're glorifying God for the way that he has blessed her. We're not saying that she has any sort of store of blessing or, or anything of the sort. She is simply a sinner saved by grace and given the unique privilege of carrying the Messiah. And really, us calling her blessed or all generations calling her blessed is the same thing that Elizabeth did just a few verses prior. She had said, blessed are you among women. She gave this blessing. And again, as we said there, that again, it was not bestowing blessing. It was recognizing the blessing that was already upon her. The same is here for all generations that call Mary blessed. So what can we learn about worship from Mary's praise here in verse 48? Well, we too can identify, right, with the humbling reality of God's grace upon our lives. Grace is the giving of something that we don't deserve. And that is fundamental to the believer's experience is that we realize we have been given so much that we don't deserve. In fact, everything that we have in Christ is an undeserved blessing and therefore is all of grace. And this is really what Paul leads to in Ephesians chapter 1. Let's turn there in Ephesians chapter 1 as Paul is reflecting upon the grace of God given to us in Christ. He's led to praise. Now he's got one big run-on sentence that goes from verse 3 to verse 14 and we're not going to read all of that. But just the first few verses from Verses 3 through 8, you'll get a sense of the celebration of the blessings that we have through Christ that are a result of God's grace to us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. 
In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His glorious grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Christian, you have been blessed abundantly in Christ. He's lavished His grace upon you. He he wasn't stingy in giving you grace. He was abundantly generous. He couldn't give out any more in what He gave to you through Christ. Your election before the foundation of the world, your predestination for adoption as sons, not second-class citizens, redemption, the forgiveness of sins through the blood of Jesus, and all this because of the grace found in in the Beloved, in Jesus Christ. Friends, as we focus on these realities of the gospel, the grace of God, it should lead us to praise, as it did for Mary. Prompt us to worship God and to thank Him and to say, great are you, Lord. Only you could devise such a wonderful plan of salvation. Only you would be so gracious and kind as to save a wretch like me as John Newton taught us to say in the hymn Amazing Grace. And so we need to meditate upon His grace every single day, asking, what do I have today that I did not earn or deserve? And then begin thanking God for the answers to that question. And praise will begin pouring from our hearts and from our lips. So we've seen, going back to Luke chapter 1, we've seen these different characteristics of God, His greatness, His salvation, His grace, and fourthly, His power. We see His power in verse 49, the first part of verse 49. Mary here gives a second kind of official reason for her praise. She says, For He who is mighty has done great things for me. He who is mighty has done great things for me. Now what are the great things? The great things are what the narrative has already described for us. The fact that God is going to bring about the Messiah through her. She's going to conceive of a son through the power of the Holy Spirit, and that was going to be the Savior of the world. I mean, that qualifies as great things, right? I mean, that's like a wonderful, amazing thing. And Mary just stands back and says, who could do such a thing? Well, it's he who is mighty, or the mighty one. You see, back in verse 35, the angel had told her that the, the, the Holy Spirit was going to come upon her and the, and the power of the Most High was going to overshadow her. So she knew that the power of God was at play here. And she believed that word. And so in verse 49, she's praising God for that same power that worked on her behalf to allow the Christ child to be born through her. Now, she doesn't speak of one of the mighty ones as if there's many, she singles it out to the one who is mighty or the mighty one. And she is here declaring in faith that God alone is awesome in power. He, in other words, she's saying He is the mightiest one. He alone has all of the might. And she is wowed at the fact that the one with all the power in the universe has chosen to direct that power towards her and for her benefit. He's done great things for me. Yes, He's done great things throughout the whole entire history of Israel that I've recorded in my Bible, Mary could say. But here she's praising God for the great things that He has done for her. And folks, this is how we too should meditate upon the power of God. Yes, we look through history of the world. We look through the history of through the scriptures and see the power of God displayed in magnificent ways and we praise him for these things. But we can also praise God for the way that he has directed his power towards each one of us. I mean, think of the power that was needed to rescue you from the clutches of hell, to turn your heart of stone to a heart of flesh. Could you do that? Could you turn your heart Could you soften it to the Lord? Could you bring you to new life? Could you 
Be, make yourself a new creation? Could someone else make you a new creation? Only one, the mightiest one. He who is mighty has done great things for me. Believer, you can say this too. He caused you to be born of God and to give you the right to become children of God. And now you have Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1.27 says. That's amazing. And it all happened because of the power of God. We cannot downplay the power of the Lord. These are true realities that have happened to the believer. And they are true of you now if you have trusted in Christ. It took the death of not just somebody. It took the death of the Son of God in order to rescue you from sin and hell. Nothing less would have sufficed. And friends, God's power is keeping you in this very moment. For you to be here and for you to be believing today is because of God's power. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. By God's power, you are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. You're being guarded by God's power through your faith this morning. So we must let God's power displayed in the pages of Scripture and displayed in our own lives lead us to worship Him and magnify Him for these great things. But the fifth characteristic of God that we see in this passage is in the second part of verse 49. Mary, after highlighting the power of God, then says, and holy is His name. And holy is His name. As she is in the midst of reflecting on these amazing realities going on in her life, the fact that she's got a baby growing in her womb by power of the Holy Spirit, it, every little aspect keeps drawing her back to the Lord. She just, I mean, each line is another new attribute of God. I mean, she's essentially rolling out a systematic theology in a few short verses. I mean, she's so meditative upon who this great God is. She didn't say, thank you, God, for being so great, and thank you, God, for being so great, and thank you for being so great. She, she doesn't run out of words. She just keeps rolling through these attributes. And she kind of seems to kind of throw in here his holiness. Oh, and holy is his name. Holiness, we typically equate to moral purity and a, and a separation from sin, which is certainly included in the term and the idea of holiness, but it, it gets its basic idea from separation from that which is common, being set apart from that which is common. And, and therefore, in, the, in the, the biggest sense, it's God's separation from humanity and from particularly sinful humanity. God is holy in that he is set apart from us. God is not just uh, quantitatively bigger than us. He is qualitatively different from us. He is a different kind of being. He's not just a big man in the sky or big man upstairs as the culture can uh, popularly describe him. He is a different kind of being and therefore that is his holiness. She says holy is his name. The name of someone in ancient times represented the person. It, was, it wasn't just uh, talking about the thing that we call him. It's, it's representing God himself. And so Mary is saying here that, that God is so different from her and different from humanity, and that is why he should be praised. And we too must regard the Lord as holy. We must Put him in that highest place in our hearts, that he is set apart from everything else, set apart in allegiance, set apart in worship. He alone occupies that place. We respect him. We bow down before him in reverence. It means that we're cognizant of the fact that because of his holiness, because of his separation, because of his purity, that we do not deserve an audience with the holy king of heaven. And therefore, it should produce humility in us that we know him and that he knows us. We must desire to see God's name hallowed, God's name treasured as holy in our lives and in this world. We want to worship God as he deserves, and that includes his holiness. 
But the final characteristic that we see in this passage that we must meditate upon, final characteristic is his mercy in verse 50. God's mercy. Verse 50. Mary says, And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. And finally, for this last characteristic that she highlights for our time here this morning is mercy, which translates the Old Testament word hesed, which in our Old Testaments is translated oftentimes loving kindness or steadfast love. And included in this steadfast love or mercy is the fact that He does not deal with us as our sins deserve. We are sinful, and Mary recognizes that. And yet God doesn't treat us as our sins deserve, and therefore He's displaying His mercy. You'll, Psalm 103 seems to be on the back of Mary's mind as she's bringing these truths forward, which, which states that the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will He keep His anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His steadfast love toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does He remove our transgressions from us. And then verse 17, But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him. And the point that Mary draws out here is that the mercy of God, the steadfast love of the Lord, is on those who fear God. Now, what does it mean to fear the Lord? Fearing the Lord, in biblical terms, simply means that we have both a dread, in a sense, of sinning against such a holy and merciful God, and that we also have a love-filled reverence for the saving mercy of this God. That even though God is so holy and I don't want to sin against Him, and yet He has been so loving and so merciful towards me. And therefore, I have, I'm essentially on my knees in, in, in fearful respect and awe and worship. And this is another way of simply saying that God blesses all who come to Him in repentance and faith. Those who turn away from their sin and those who turn to God in faith he blesses, and his mercy is poured out upon him. Mary celebrates the fact that this mercy is from generation to generation. Which you know what that means for us this morning? It's for our generation too. God's mercy is available to each one of you this morning. The only requirement for us to receive this mercy is that we come and we repent and believe in Jesus Christ. We confess Him as Lord, as Mary does. And we can know the joy of being saved in God's Son. You see, it's only because of Mary's Son, Jesus Christ, that you and I are able to be recipients of God's mercy. It's through His death on the cross and subsequent resurrection from the dead that secured our eternal salvation. And so, are you burdened with your sins and iniquities this morning? Come to the merciful God. Are you, are you weighed down with the fact that you've been ignoring God? Come to the merciful God. Have you been fighting against God and resisting His will? Stop fighting the mightiest one and turn to the merciful God who welcomes you, welcomes all, all the repentant with open arms. You see, true worship only flows from an accurate meditation on the attributes of God. If we get God wrong, if we get our theology wrong, then we get worship wrong. And that's where the, the understanding of who God is as revealed in the Scriptures is, is so crucial for us to do and for us to devote a lifetime of study of who God is. If we want to worship truly, then we must know God truly. And so I ask you, have, how's your worship been? Have you been worshiping God truly as of late? Has it been perfunctory, just going through the motions? 
When was the last time that you meditated upon the character of God and his loving actions towards you in Christ? Not just hearing about it and knowing about it, but meditating. That means spending time soaking in it, letting your, uh, letting your soul just sit in it. The more we spend time reading about God and his word and thinking on him as we read there, the more we will be drawn to a deeper knowledge of him, deeper fellowship with him, and deeper worship of his holy name. May God lead us to that even this week. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Our holy God, we approach you this morning only in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. For we could not approach you in our own righteousness because it is as filthy rags. We have done nothing to deserve an audience with you. And so we are humbled. We are grateful that you would allow lowly people such as us to pray to you and to know that you hear us, that you listen to us. Father, I ask this morning that you might drive these truths deep in our hearts. May we know you truly. May we be drawn to an ever deeper study of who you are, that our worship might be more pure, more excellent, more glorifying to your name. And Father, I pray for us as we scatter out into the world this week, that you might equip us to be magnifiers of you, that through our words and our actions, that we would seek to show you off as great, that we would make much of you to those around us. Oh, Father, give us deep adoration of you, deep boldness to speak your praise. And may you use us in mighty ways for your name's sake, because we want to give you the praise for what you do in and through us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.